going to start another little lesson today on our new creation realities. And it's going to be called, if you're subtitling and taking notes, it's going to be called How to Overcome. What does the Bible say about overcoming? Now, one of the things I want to share with you is if somebody takes you out to a meal and pays for your meal and pays the tip for the meal, do you need to pay for it again? No, that would be silly, wouldn't it? Amen. Somebody prayed paid for your freedom, died and rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father, makes intercession for you. You have him in your heart. He represents our Father and gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us and to teach us through the Word of God so our eyes of our understanding become enlightened and we may understand what God's will is for our life. Now, we know the dividing line of scripture. The dividing line of scripture is every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven, from the father of lights in whom he doesn't change nor alter his way. How many good and perfect gifts? All good and perfect gifts. So the dividing line of your life is if you've got something going on that is not divinely perfect and good, you can take authority over it because it didn't come from God. Say amen. Now what the devil will do, and this is a preliminary, the devil will take us and make us feel guilty. Oh, you're going through this because you did things when you were younger, and this is all catching up with you now. How many have ever heard something like that? Don't wave your, wave your hand at me. Amen. So we need to understand some of the things that I have to share with you. So you have been absolutely perfectly purchased redeemed, and set into victory. Now, here's where Christians miss it. They think, think they're trying to get the victories when they have the victory in Christ. Amen. Think about that. Who won our victory? Who said it was finished? Who sits down at the right hand of the Father? makes intercession for us, who represents us, so that you and I can walk free. Can you say amen? amen. But religion will teach you, you are redeemed, but not all. There are still things God is working on you, and, and they put a little label in the thinking, uh, and that is that God covers you and protects you, but he lets certain things happen to you to teach you something. Now, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, that is from the pit. And the reason why it's from the pit, because how many know that things that we go through are not perfect? Although we have Jesus and we're going through those things, we have the perfect one. Those things we can pray about and we can take authority over because they are not blessing us. Can you say amen? So, Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you and I shall fear no evil. And you know, the Old Testament says, and this is for Sherry here, that for you are with me, right? See, that's Old Testament. Where is God now? So it would go like, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's the earth, the earth system, the world system that's failing. We shall fear no evil because Satan gives the fear. Fear is like a magnet that draws him. Same with anger and fighting. Okay. We will fear no evil for God is in us. See, this is New Testament. Think about it. The, the problem I find with talking with a lot of Christians is they've got this God somewhere out here mindedness. And God will walk with you. And hold my hand, Jesus, and don't let me stray. Now, I'm not putting that down. That's a good thing, okay? But think about that. Here you got God Almighty on the inside of you. And you go, oh, hold my hand, Jesus. For some people, not you, but for some people, they think that God is around them all the time as long as they do good and please him. Folks, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior... The Father accepted you. Every bit of your garbage, every bit of your goodness. 
And now you have not become a sinner saved by grace. Now you become a child of God, a child of light. And he says, I will neither leave you nor forsake you. I will work in you to do my good will and my pleasure. The thing that a lot of us have to learn is we have to sit still and let God work on us, asking and inviting him to change us, to work on us, to change our thinking, to change the way we look at things. Now, how do you, how do you know to do that, Pastor Kerry? Well, I found out through my life, there are certain things that keep repeating themselves. Have you ever experienced certain things that seem to come back? Certain problems that seem to have a little signature or a signature on it? Sure, these patterns are the familiars of your past coming through the enemy's workings to try to set you up on what's already seated in your thinking. What do you mean? We have patterns. You and I have patterns. And those patterns, some are good in our life, but some are not so good. Everyone look at your neighbor and go, not so good. So what the enemy tries to do is get us into a fallen old person pattern that we used to be. And that instead of dealing with things in faith and in prayer and love, we start going back into analyzing thinking about how to figure out what's wrong, and boom, the enemy got gotcha. you. Because the master at reasoning is the devil. And when, now catch this, please, catch this. I wish Joanna and a few other people were in here paying attention to this. You see, the mind is an open arena. And unless you know how to bind it, take authority over suggestions of the enemy, then you're going to have things traipsing through your mind. It's like kids with dirty shoes over your clean rug. You know, you know, walking through your mind. And if you're not wise and smart enough about it, you'll let that continually to go until it starts to affect you. So these patterns that you have, your prayer should be, Father, help remove the negative patterns that I sow and don't even know it. Help remove the things of the arena of my mind where I'm analyzing and, and trying to figure things out. Now, I did not say throw away your mind, did I? You need the spiritual end of your mind with God's ability and wisdom working in it. You need to cast down your old carnal thinking or the old natural thinking because it doesn't have all the answers we need. God has all the answers. and you, know, you get a chance to hear Scott's testimony, how many times God stepped in and shown Scott what to do about something. And maybe you, well, I haven't heard your testimonies, but I, I get a chance to talk to Scott once in a while. And he shares those things with me, and I think they're fantastic. Amen. You ready to get in this lesson? Let's turn around and look at our, our scripture. All right, this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Did you see that word? Begotten us again. In other words, when you first came into this world, you were saved. You were spiritually alive. You reached the age of accountability and you died and separated from God. So what does he do? He's begotten us again to a lively hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can be regenerated, born again. A resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And to the inheritance incorruptible. Everyone say incorruptible. Folks, do you know God put an inheritance in you that Satan can't take away from you? Remember, he's a thief. He comes to steal your victory. If you didn't have victory, he wouldn't come. You see, we have the victory. We have the total freedom. So that's why the thief comes to steal that and make us think that we don't. So let's read that part again. To an inheritance incorruptible, Satan can't put his hands on it. And undefiled that does not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Through faith for salvation. Yay, all the saved people wave. 
ready to be revealed in the last time. See, what God is doing is he's peeling open the book to you. If you'll be with him and walk with him, he'll open the book to you. You won't have to run to certain Greek teachers to find out what it means. He'll just give you it. But I love Greek. I follow Greek and teach Greek. And Rick Renner is a great friend of mine. And I got his gyms and all these kind of things too. But i rather have God speak to me and reveal something to me beyond the limitations of my understanding. You know, to be filled with love past our knowledge and understanding. Amen. All right. And then it goes on. He says, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What time are we living in? All right. Amen. So you should be asking God when you're meeting with him to begin to open the scripture to you. Now, if you're a busy person, a lot of us are, that you haven't got time to, you know, do all this and, you know, like to be like me. See, my full time job is to study the word pray for you and commend you to the word of God and preach the word. That's my full-time job. I do other things and stuff too. But sometimes we all have full-time jobs or things that we used to do keeps us so busy. So don't try to compare my time with God and your time with God. Just get as much time with God as you can. Can you say amen? And start greeting him first thing. Because you can tell God all you want. Or even testify to other people how wonderful he is. But if you don't meet with them first thing and be consistent about it, your actions are saying a different thing. And you don't mean to do that. I don't mean to do that. That's what I was doing. And God was still using me mightily. Just think what, if God says, just think if you would meet with me every day, what would happen, son? And I started. Amen. Are you with me? So let's get in our lesson. How we overcome. Glory to God. So in this lesson, we will show you how to maintain and keep overcoming in your walk with God. It is lined out in the fact that Revelation says how to do it. We're going to have a simple lesson today. So you'll be saying, oh, there's a lot more things than just that. Yeah, but these three things that I'm going to mention are will cover all of those things, just not in detail. Are you with me? All right, so let's go on. So this is a fallen planet, I know you agree, with lots of temptations and traps for the human being to fall into. Each one is designed to ruin our life. Okay. Now, Jesus was tempted, so you're not above temptation. But the key of you being tempted a lot or not, let me say that again, the key of being tempted a lot or not has to do with how much in the flesh you live. Because every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own desires. Desires are in the flesh, not in the spirit. God's in the spirit. Fleshly, loosely desires are feeling not liked or feeling not wanted. It's all in the flesh. That's a game Satan plays. He worked intricately, lacing our mind with fears and frustrations. That's why we have to wash our mind with the water of the word. To wash that bad negative stuff out. Say amen. Another thing, we need to realize quickly that accepting Jesus Christ and his help is our only escape from this planet. And the only escape from our body of sin. The the Bible calls our flesh the body of sin. So we need to learn these three principles well. And remember them so we can share them with others. Remember, we're supposed to share our faith. We're supposed to give Jesus out. And it acts like a siphoning hose. (laughs) More of Jesus you give out, the more God comes up and in. The more you give out, the more God comes up and in. The key is we sit, dwell on ourselves, and we, we, we grow mold. <laughs> we get little polywogglies. Oh, poor, I'm just this. And we always talk about ourselves. Stop it. I don't want to hear about you. I want to see God in you operating. Look at your neighbor and say, God in us. God. Yeah, that's what it is. God in us. 
I remember that guy who said to me, Carrie, I would love to. You said some great words in your preaching, but there was too much of Carrie. I said, what do you mean? He says, you talk about what you do too much. Now, he was, became one of my best friends, okay? So don't think he was being mean. He just was a little ahead spiritually than me at that time. Ed Trichler. And so basically, I mentioned his name because he's gone on to be with the Lord, but he went out of his way to help work with me and to, to love me through my problems. Not very many people did. You know, when I had problems, they all split because they had their own. <laughs> Hello? We're, I, don't know, I don't know what to do. Please don't do anything. Back off. Let God help me. Amen. So anyway, let's go on past that. But think about this. Once we cover these three main areas, you'll be covered. You already have the victory. So stop saying, God, give me the victory over this. Give me the victory. No, this is the way you say it. God, I have the victory over this. I'm commanding my body to function normally. The way you want it to function. If there's something broken, I ask you to fix it. And Lord, would you please do it at night too? As long as you don't wake me up. I remember the invitation of God to do everything. To help you with everything. It's not an insult with God. It's the reason why God came so we could be rescued off this planet. Say amen, everybody. All right. So, amen. Go with me to John chapter 3, please. We're going to start with verse 1. We must be born again. So let me encourage you, if you're a Christian and you can't remember when you said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins... Come into my heart, I surrender. Doesn't have to be those exact words, but it has to cover those things. I surrender and turn my life over to you. You need to know you did that. You can't be guessing along that you're saved. Because Satan will back off of certain people and make everything go good for a little while. Thinking they're saved until they crust over with religion. They're crabby, they're negative, they're down, they're ripping people apart for God. Hallelujah. You know, that's, that's religion. That's something God hates. Are you with me? And so I want you to catch this. All right. We must be born again. We must learn to walk from the inside out. And we must do it quickly. All right. Don't fiddle while Rome burns. Okay. John 3 verse 1 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a religious man. A ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. How did he know that? Because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Christians, it's not what you say. It's the miracles God does through you that makes the difference. Hello. You can promise everybody a rose garden, but don't forget to tell them about the thorns. Just trying to get you to say, you know, it's not here. It's totally godness coming out of here, out of your entire core. So when I say heart, it's the core. The heart of a tree is the core of the tree. That's where all the little lines go up. The heart of you is your spirit and your soul. Your flesh has nothing to do with it. And that's why religion is so good. Because it makes the flesh feel like it's doing things nice. The flesh will make you feel, and I don't want to, no, I'm not picking on you. The flesh will make you feel that if you went to a carnival, you're saved. Because you got all the lights and the clowns and everybody doing all that. And a lot of times for Christians, what the enemy's done is he put them in a place where everything is happy and going good and everything. But they've never surrendered and got born again. And so now their life, every time everything is going good, it's God. And every time it's not going good, it's them or the devil and on and on. Now, there's no stability in that. Say amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. You're going to get this one time, okay? So he goes on. You're a ruler of the Jews. Now, Jesus said in verse 3, 
Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or born, relit, or new, same things, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now see, right there, unless you're born again and your spirit's alive, you won't be able to perceive the, king, the kingdom of God at all. It'll be just a nice religious thing. But the Bible says when you get, your, get born again, say, Jesus, come into my heart. He opens our spiritual eyes, and then we can look into the spiritual matters of the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? And another encouraging thing is Satan cannot do that. You can get born again and say, God, open my eyes, see into all the provisions of the kingdom of God, begin to understand from God's point of view things, and Satan cannot do that. You become like the wind to him. He doesn't know where you're going, where you're coming, because you're not operating by your patterns anymore. I said you're not operating by your patterns anymore. You're operating by the spirit from the inside out. The new creation where he can't touch. That's why we don't walk with our mind. We walk with our heart helping our mind. Say amen. I need a little help. I need so much help. Bless you to my family and all our friends that are coming in through the garage. I forgot to greet you this morning. Sorry. All right. So let's go on. So in verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? See, the natural thinking. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, everyone say water and Spirit, he cannot enter. See the difference? Not see the kingdom. Now it's enter the kingdom of God. Now, let me see how much you remembered. When did the kingdom of God come? Pentecost. Pentecost. This is the spirit into the world and brought the kingdom of heaven at Pentecost. And when you get born again, the kingdom is also in you with God. Say amen. But to perceive it and to enter into its market exchanges. What do you mean? God has all the goodies. If you want the goodies, you got to go to God. In order to go to God, you got to know a God exists. You got to know how to do that. And that is seeing the kingdom. And then it says if you're born of water and of the spirit, then you can enter the kingdom. So when you and I now have the kingdom in us, the kingdom around us, but we have instant access into the kingdom. So let's say you're a missionary or maybe a mom. Just you have something that came down that really needs a lot of help. You can walk right into the throne room of God and say, Lord, I grab this miracle in Jesus' name and I part it to this situation. You have that access. Satan does not. The problem is not presented in religion. It's not presented hardly at all. But it says, if, except we're born of water, right? And of the, come on, follow me. We'll go out there and make food. And a dumb thing. You sit here and get the word. That's my little pick on you. Okay. All right. Get in here and get the word. That's the best food. Now, the thing I'm trying to say here is when you're born again, you've got this kingdom inside of you. Now, to be born of water, what does that mean? I know that's what's taught, and I will agree with part of that, but it's not talking about that right now. It's talking about natural birth, because you came out of a sack of water, didn't you? And remember, when Jesus talked about it, he says, he who does not enter the door of the sheepfold except tries to climb up some other ways, the thief and the robber. The sheepfold is the earth, too. Satan was never born here, Terry. So he never came by water. Okay? He doesn't have a birthright here. He stole it from Adam. You and I have a birthright now back in Christ where we have authority over the devil just because we're born in this earth. And then we have authority over the devil because we are born again in God. Not only that, but we have authority over the enemy because God lives in us. And if we begin to grow in the Lord, every time the devil shows his ugly head, 
just open your heart up and pour some God on him. It's called the salt. The little sluggy doesn't like slug salt. Just when the enemy's coming against you, instead of cringing and go, oh God, why, oh why? Open up and begin to worship God and let God will pour salt on that situation. And then say, thank you, God, for reaching out and into that situation. Don't you know greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world? The key is the pure gospel of God has not been preached for a long time. You're hearing the pure gospel of God. Not because I'm anything great. Is I want to I have a relationship that Jesus promised us. Not what churches have said is ours. Do you understand? Now, there's nothing wrong with good preaching men and women of God and people who love the Lord, brothers and sisters. But when it strays away from the gospel, it gets us into bondage. Like, for example, you never know what God's going to do till you tarry tomorrow. That'll get you into bondage. Because immediately we're negative. We'll say, oh, I can't wait. Instead of, yeah, I can't either. God and I are going to be conquering through the day. We don't make those statements of faith. We, we crawl into our reasoning faculty. And then the enemy starts lacing things on us. Everyone say, oh, me. Oh, my. Jesus is lo Lord over you know, anyway, so he is. So we're going to cover these four things. Everyone say, okay. Number one, by the blood of a lamb being born again, we overcome by the blood of the lamb. Number one, we're going to cover that real quickly. Number two, by the word of our testimony. What you say is very important because that's how you got saved. You believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth. And then thirdly, we overcome by loving not ourselves unto the end. In other words, the word selves unto is actually the Greek is our selfish selves. We love not our selfish life unto the end. In other words, I'm not living for what Carrie can get. I'm living unto my God, not to get him to give me anything. He's not Santa Claus. But if I will just love on in, how many fathers do you know who is very loving would turn away somebody who just wants to come and tell them, I love you. I want a relationship with you, God. And then God opens the windows of heaven, he says. The whole game is in religion. The game is to get you thinking that you got to be behaving just so and acting. I believe in a good confession. I believe in certain principles that we have to practice. But I don't believe we should be so legalistic with them that we can't have any joy. Can you say amen? I got to watch what I say. I got to watch what I say. Well, yeah. But not like that. <laughs> Remember, anything with fear in it is not from God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind that's what he's given us so if your mind's not been sound you know how to get it that way all right so let's and the fourthly we overcome by staying alert and ready that's it just stay alert and ready you know when it comes to god don't fall asleep i'm sorry amen all right first point by the blood of the lamb we overcome by the blood of the lamb go with me to hebrews chapter 9 look at verse 14 and 15 i love these cups i got some uh, protein in here for me so watch when i open it <laughs> wouldn't that be some amen all right oh yes Okay, by the blood of the Lamb we overcome. Hebrews 9, verse 14. Listen, read along if you can. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, cleanse you, your conscience from dead works? You see, in the Old Testament, they got their sins covered. Now listen to me carefully. They got their sins covered year by year. But they never got sin removed from their conscience. 
which gave them guilt and inferiorities. So what Jesus did is he died, shed his blood, and by accepting him, he removed sin and all the guilt that goes with it from your spirit. Can you say amen? So you don't have to run around saying I'm unworthy. God knows that. Now you're worthy. And it's an insult to God because here you carry his son around. You carry God around and you're running around saying I'm unworthy. Can't sit still. You know, I'm unworthy. You know, you're not. You're a child of the living king. He loves your face. He loves to hear from you. Don't keep yourself away from him. Amen. So he says, how much through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse 15. And for this reason, he is a mediator like an umpire. Okay. Of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgression, ours, under the first covenant, that those who are all called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So in the Old Testament, people didn't have God in them. You know that. They had no idea that God loved them except for Abraham. Abraham knew because he was raised in Ur of the Chaldees. In Ur of the Chaldees, that's where a lot of angelic hosts operated. One of the first civilizations that came forth. Hello. So he had a lot of people. His father was, I think it was Terah, who literally was the second in command in Pharaoh's court. So, or in somebody's court. I probably messed that one up. I don't want to. In whoever was ruling in that Samaria. And it had all of the ancient wisdoms and all of the stuff we see in ancient aliens and all that. They're just trying to bring out and show that all of these things that the fallen angels had did. Abraham was well aware of all that. And he knew God was kind. But the rest of the Israelites and the people going through the, the wilderness, they didn't understand a kind God. They just knew if they pleased him and did what he was, they were told, God would rain miracles down on them. So when love showed up, Jesus, they didn't recognize him. Because he came that we might know the father, didn't he? Didn't he? And yet the Israelites are so bound by religion and fear, and I'm not trying to put him down. That's just what the devil does to people like that when they live in the flesh. Gets you all bound up. You can't think. You can't act. Instead of just enjoying God. So they had no revelation of that. When Jesus showed up in the scene. They rejected him. Because he did not fit. Their understanding of who God was. Let me ask you. When I share the word of God. The Jesus that I share. Is a little bit different than some maybe. That you heard before. Not you piggy. You've been with me forever. But some of the religious teachings that we taught in our past, just glimpsed for a moment, completely off the wall. You know, you, you have to do this and you don't do that. And you got to be this and you got to be that. Sounds like legalism to me. The do's and the don'ts, that's a work. What it is, God wants your heart. He wants you to do it because you love them. He wants you to give because you love them. He wants you to love one another because he first loved you. He wants you to do it for the only motivation that he loves you and he's right there to help you. If that's your motivation, that's what you do, you are going to excel as a Christian. Anything else will fail because it's of man and not of God. Say, oh me. Go with me to 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 6. Still on the first point, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 through 8 says, this is he who came by water and blood. Now we know what the water is. Now I'm not saying that Jesus didn't get baptized because he got baptized by John. But I'm saying in order to operate in the earth legally, you have to be born here. Satan is not operating legally anymore. Jesus stripped him. So that's why you can rebuke him. You can even make it a game. Get some beanbags. 
and put the word of God, the name of Jesus and stuff on the bean bags. Get a little target out there and put some ugly looking face of the devil there and go in the name of Jesus. Pow! In the name of Jesus. Pow! Now you go, I don't really want to do that. Well, I don't really think you should, but you know, if you want to. But every time we become aggressive and excited about God, we push back the darkness. The little radiation of God comes off of us like light, and it just pushes back the darkness. That's why Satan tries to come immediately in your life to get you all caught up and engaged in the problems of this life so your light doesn't shine like that. But no, you're going to meet with God and get your batteries charged. First words out of your mouth is, praise God. Let's go get them. Get who? Get the lost souls. Folks, we're running out of time. We're running out of time. Are you with me? So he goes on and it says, by water and by blood. And it's the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. Now verse 7 says, for there are three that bear record in heaven. Now you know that Jesus was not the son of God in heaven at first. He was the word. And it will say, there are three that bear record in heaven. The father, the word, and the Holy Spirit. Psalms 107 verse 20 says, and he sent his word and it delivered us. His word was Jesus, his son. That's when he became his only begotten son. Begotten of the earth, of the flesh, for the glory of saving us and taking our sins. Now he is the son at the right hand of the father. Say amen. Boy, some of you go to college and not learn that. I know people don't even know that. And they've been to Bible college and all that kind of stuff. The simple truth is, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That God saw his son being begotten to redeem us as a family. Woo, that's glorious. All right, a couple of points I want to give you. There are three. These three are one, and there are three that bear witness on earth. Listen to this. The Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit. The water, that's baptism. And the blood, okay? See, I'm not leaving baptism out, but I want to show you, unless you get born in the earth, you can baptize the devil all he wants. It's never going to get saved. Hello. So let's talk about something more than that. And so don't be religious and close off you being educated, okay? I know I, I can't teach you a whole lot because you know everything. But <laughs> be open, okay? All right. Are you still with me? All right, now I want to take you to 1 John chapter 1. You guys know this scripture. This is exciting. Listen to this. This is about us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. Listen. It says, this is a message. This is the message we're supposed to preach. This is a message that we have heard from him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Joanna, no darkness at all. Plenty of darkness here, but not in your heart. Amen. So, listen well. Don't be easily distracted. Amen. And you'll keep growing just like you are. Listen, I want to go on. And then it says, and if we say that we have fellowship with him, walk on in darkness... We lie, and here's the key, we lie and don't practice the truth. The key is a lot of people will say things, but how much are they practicing? I'm going to say it again. You can tell me you're Christian until you're blue in the face. How much does your life show your love for God? That's the most important thing. So try to do a lot less speaking and more showing God. Let me say that again. Try to do a lot less speaking about God. It's okay. It's wonderful. Please do. But do ask God to help you show God out of you. Project him out in your conversation and your actions and what you do, how you think, how you tend to care, your prayer. One of the ways that God told me, he says, son, you, you know, you honor me with your lips, but I hardly hear you in prayer. 
So when are you going to give me the time that I need to change you? Ah, uh, when I get around to it. Oh, wait a minute. I found some round to it. I, I don't know who gave me those. They're fun. All right, so if we walk in the light as Christ is in the light, the blood of Jesus, what? Continually, it cleanses from all sin. So let me read that part to you. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The Amplified in the Greek says, constantly supplied to us daily. So it's not like it's not like this, and I'm sure some of you have done this. When you made a mistake, you say, oh, God, forgive me, forgive me, and God does. Okay, immediately. But if you try to walk in the light, in the word, meeting with God properly, you won't slip up as much. You won't stub your toe. You won't stubble as much. You won't insert your foot in your mouth. I do that. I used to do that a lot. You know, you meet somebody and you look at them and you say, oh, you've gained weight last time I saw you. I'm just joking. I've never done that. Never done that. You know, you don't greet people that way. Gosh, you're looking pretty beat up. What happened? <laughs> And sometimes I think we think God's going to greet us that way when we meet with him in the morning. Here's our hair's all matted. You've got drool on the side of your mouth. Like your cup of coffee. Your eye, you're wiping sleep from your eyes. That's how I come to pray. And you know, the old man would think, God, he's going to say, why don't you just clean yourself up before you meet with me, you know. That's religion. It's religion. This outward man is not going. Keep it clean, feed it, you know, bathe it, do whatever it needs to do. But don't bring your flesh to church and certainly don't bring your flesh to the Lord unless you want to throw it out on the altar. Because God is not going to listen to this part. He's going to listen to your heart and the core of your being. And he's not going to look at you and say, boy, you look a mess today, Carrie. Because <laughs> there's not a thing you can say, think, do that he's not aware of. Just remember, God gave you free will. He gave Adam free will. He says something to Adam. Adam, where are you? Now, how many used to think that when God said, Adam, where are you? He was looking for him. I hope not. God knew exactly the moment he ate, his body was changed. He had a poison in him that could not go away. Only could be redeemed. And then ripped off like a cocoon. And then the new man gets a new body. Can you say man? A renewed body. Where are you Adam? Then God asks him a question. Remember God will from time to time ask you questions. Have you eaten of the, the fruit of the tree I told you not to eat of? It was the woman you gave me God. All right. So let's go to point two. We overcome by the word of our testimony. So Hebrews chapter 4, please. Go to Hebrews chapter 4 with me, starting at verse 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, that's Jesus Christ, who has passed through the heavens. Now you know there's three heavens, atmosphere, stellar heavens, and into the kingdom where God dwells. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our what? Our confession or the word of our testimony. Somebody says, do you love Jesus? Yeah, you got religion. If you find yourself backing away and not talking about it, you're letting yourself be ashamed. You don't need to be ashamed. Be bold. It's because people don't talk about God boldly, not, not insultably, but boldly. People don't know, so they think religion is just, just another religion. Talk to people and bring God in your conversation, everything you talk about. I talk about fishing, God's in there. I talk about working in the yard, God's in there. I never have a conversation, and you test this out with you without bringing God in somewhere. Try to make that note. Amen? How we doing? You're so pretty. You made time stand still. 
So it goes on further to say, for we do not have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Don't be timid. God loves your face. He loves everything about you. What about all this awful stuff I have? He doesn't consider it. But he's amazed that you do. Paying so much attention to what the, you can't do instead of loving God for what you can with him do. Say all me. Amen. It goes on further to say, yet without sin and let us therefore come boldly. See, God doesn't want you to be timid. You have Jesus in your heart. Come boldly. God, I need help. And God says, okay, let's talk. Now, what you don't understand, how many here remember when you're talking, when conversation first came over the wires, remember, what was it, teletype? Was it tele? I, I don't know. But you could send it, and then you could answer. You could send it, and you could answer. And then it turned into the tele -woman, I mean, telephone. You know, it's tell three things, telegraph, telephone, and tell a woman, and it'll get around. <laughs> That's an old one. Sorry about it. You know I'm only joking. Okay. But see, in our conversation, so we have a phone. We can converse now. We have cell phones. There's all kinds of computers. It's all dealing with conversation and, and getting that conversation right. We need to hold fast to what we believe. How many here believe you're saved? then you should talk about it. How many believe you're forgiven of all your sin? Tell people about that. I know a place and a thing that you can do that get rid of all your sin. Yeah. And then tell them about Jesus. See, they have to make peace with the Lord. Okay. Tell them all the good things that God's doing in your life. All, how he saved you out of the muck and mire and, and he's bringing you right, yeah? But what do we do? We do not want to be talking about all the things that are going wrong all the time. Because by doing that, you're just going to overload your mind with anxiety. God doesn't want that. He says to pray about everything. Say, oh me. So the word of our testimony, how did you get saved? If you don't think words are important, how did you get saved? You believed and you spoke. God honored your words and came right on in on the telegraph. Shoo, and answered you with a supernatural rebirth of God. Then he says, now take this and go meet with me. Go study my word. Go to church where you can learn to praise and see other people that do the same. And remember, you're covered in the blood. And keep the word of your testimony true to what God has done for you. Say amen. And it goes on further. It says, for the, we're, the word of God is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. I got the hiccups. And with the mouth confessions made unto salvation. Folks, we limit God. That's God calling and saying, amen. We limit. Who is that? Yeah, uh-huh. Amen. It's okay. Just let it ring. Don't answer it. Don't run after it. That's just what the enemy wants to do. You know, just get in front of everything and just block off everything. No. So, I had one guy call me one time. I was right in the middle of prayer and in a two-day, three-day fast. And he calls me. And I said, I finally answered it, rang. Remember the days where the phone would ring and ring? No answer machine, just ring and ring. Finally, they hang up. Well, finally, I got up and I answered. I said, what? He says, God told me to call. 
I said, no, he didn't. And he says, yes, he did. I says, no, he didn't. Because God would have told you I was on my knees, on my face, fasting and praying. And he would have told you to wait. So a lot of times we think God is in, let's get it done now. Hurry, 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 hurry. Run, 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 run. And then you're doing it so sloppy. And it's so, that's slow down. Guess what? God provided you a dishwasher so you can slow down. I mean, there's nothing like watching our body while through the camera, you know, while we're over busy. Amen. We don't want to be doing that. Okay? So we got you a dishwasher so that you just scrape your plate in the garbage and put it all in that bucket. Pastor Kerry will go over there and put it in the dishwasher. I'm so excited to run it for the first time. Anyway, let's go back to the, to the sermon, okay? I really haven't left you because that's going to fit the sermon. You see, when we keep our confession, God answers prayer. When we hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering, he will be faithful who's promised us. So we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our... So let me ask you, are you saved? Oh, I, you haven't convinced me. Are you saved? Yes. Should be bright and clear. Yes. Do you live for God? Yes. You see? You should be bright and clear. Now, when you start finding yourself backstepping, of course, you don't want to overpower somebody. Be careful that you leave them with a message. God always told me, he says, leave everyone that you're with with a message of thinking about God. Doesn't matter what. Leave them with the fact that you love God and you want them to love him too. Can you do that with all your relatives? Oh, no, I, you know, I, I, mean, I, I see you better. They might go to hell and God will pull them right up in front of you and say, I gave you three opportunities to share Christ with them and you didn't want to irritate them. You don't know that we're going to stand before Jesus and answer those kind of questions. Maybe you ought to think about that. He'll just wipe the tears away and you won't get into trouble. But we're not thinking that God wants us to share them. Say amen. All right, so we overcome by the blood of uh, the Lamb, the word of our testimony. Listen to this scripture. This is Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Do you believe God's faithful? Amen. Yeah, we got born again. Our confession should be centered around Christ. Amen? All right, let's go to our next point. We're overcome by not loving ourselves, selfish loving ourselves until the end. Folks, there's only one thing that the devil needs to beat you up with. All you guys are looking at me, batting your eyes. What's that? Your flesh. If you learn to die to your flesh daily, Satan can't use it to make you feel guilty, to make you feel like a failure. Because you laid it before God and you said, Lord, crucify it. And Lord God, I don't want it back on me until it's been cleansed. I mean, talk to God that way when you meet with him. So he can literally press and clean this garment. This is all this is, it's a garment. It doesn't stand on its own doesn't operate on its own. Your flesh is just a garment. So please don't let it dictate to the rest of you. And he says, look, hold fast to that confession of your faith. All right, the next one is not loving yourself. Go with me to Matthew 16. I love this. 20 through 24 to 26. Amen. Now, Jesus had disciples, didn't he? And, and so let me just share you. He had many outward disciples. Many, many, many of them. Then the inner part were, were 70. 70 key disciples. Then within that 70 was the 12 disciples. And then within that 12, there were three. Peter, James, and John, which he took up into the transfiguration. Shows the inner core. Now, I asked God about that. You know what he told me? He says, I always move more with those that pay closer attention to me. 
if you don't pay any attention, you're not hanging out with me, then you're going to operate in your own strength and things will work sometimes and things won't. I'd rather do it the other way. Can you say amen? All right. So here we go. And so it says, Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after him, anyone? This is what you have to do. It's not as bad as it sounds, okay? It says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now I used to struggle with that. What's this taking up the cross? What's this taking up the cross? Taking up our cross. What is that? And God said to me, I mean, I love God. I go to him and say, Lord, you know, I don't take up Jesus' cross. And I couldn't figure out how that would fit. He says, no, you take up your own death. Everywhere you go, you are dead to yourself and alive to God. So taking up your cross means you take up your death and you live for God. Say, I got it. Amen. You take up your death and you live for God. All right, let's continue to read. All right. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever desires to lose his life for my sake shall find it. Boy, that's a good exchange. I'd rather have the things God reveals and gives me than the things I try to get myself. What do they call that? A white elephant gift? <laughs> if you do. Anyway, moving right on. A cupid doll? For what profit is it of a man to gain the whole world? In other words, get all your toys and everything and lose his own soul. Or what will a man exchange for his soul? You know what I exchanged for my soul? Jesus. Jesus, I need you. I need you to help my thinking. The stress sometimes that I feel. See, I want to be a friend of all of you. I want, I want to be your friend and all. But sometimes it's hard to be a friend because when you're with me, this is it. And so if you're going to act like a, you know, a squirrely dude and think that there's another side of Carrie that's going to go right along with you, it's not going to happen. And so what will happen is you, you know, start to do something or it's not right. I'm going to open my mouth and say, mm -mm, don't do that around me. And I'll probably lose friendships. Because most people think friendship is a human thing. But the Bible uses the word friendship as a covenant term. A covenant term. Which means if you become a friend of God, that means he can trust you in all that he asks you to do. Because you will try to do it. And he will be right there to help you. Remember, you never do things by yourself. For I can't do a thing without him. I'm nothing without him. We need him to help us go through our day. So please invite him and don't ignore him along the way. Goes on further to say in my notes, never forget the devil needs our flesh to tempt us and to misguide us, deceive us. This is why we must learn to die to ourselves. What does a prophet, if he, a man gain the whole world, lose his own soul? A couple of points I want to give you. Never forget, shutting down the flesh shuts down the enemy's ability to deceive us and lead us astray. Thirdly, we are to lay up treasures in heaven from the spirit realm and not on the earth where moss can break in and, and thieves can come in and steal. We lay up for our treasures in heaven. Does that mean God doesn't want us to have anything? No, he wants us to have everything. He just want, doesn't want those things to have you. Do you understand what I'm saying? He doesn't want what you have to control you. He wants to lead and guide you. He wants you to have all the good toys you can have and be able to stay on the giving side of them. What do you mean? If God blessed you with something, immediately dedicate it to God and say, Lord, I'm at the giving side of this. If you gave this to me, I'll enjoy it. If you gave it to me to pass along, I'll enjoy it. But never possess things that are created on the earth. Let God give them to God and he's able to keep them for you. I drove a truck. 
I bought the truck for 1200 bucks from my company. I went to my boss and said, which one of the ones that have the highest maintenance on it? He showed me this beat up truck I bought for $1,200. By the time I was done driving that truck, that truck had a half a million miles on it. Didn't burn one little bit of oil. How did it get like that? Praying over it. Asking God, we might have an automobile. We need to pray over glory to God. I call it a faith mobile. We have our faith mobiles. Amen. Are you with me? Come on, smile up. Smile up. Amen. I don't give 20 minute sermons. You're not going to be able to exist on that. Nine. Luke 9 verse 62 says, But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Now, this is Old Testament, so he's saying to his disciples, You can't start following me and then keep looking back like Lot's wife. Wondering if you missed something. Hello? He's not saying that you can't enjoy life. What he's saying is, don't be like Lot's wife and long for the sin and the debauchery. Some would say, oh, wicked. <laughs> yeah. All right, last point. We, we're to stay alert and ready. Say amen. amen. Boy, did I preach long with all these programs. Literally, it's Mark 13. It says, take heed, to watch and pray that you do not know when the time is. So if we, I'm just going to talk about it. If we don't stay alert, we'll be asleep. Folks, where were we when they took God out of the schools? Where was the church? The woman ended up being cut up in the desert. Her body was found many, many months, maybe years later. This little lawyer took God out of the schools. Where's the church? People are trying to take God out of our country. They're trying to take God out of our money. God out of this, God out of that. You can't let them. So how do we deal with that, Pastor Kerry? By staying alert and alive. So you're not fighting with your own power. You're not fighting with your vote, even though I want all of you to vote and vote right. You're fighting with your prayer power. Amen. And people, Christians that don't have a very big prayer life, you're not fighting at all. You're just trying to survive. Don't look at me in that tone of voice, because I know if you didn't know what to do and when to do it, then you're going to come under circumstances and say, well, do his best to wipe you out. And thank God, we already won when we accept Jesus. We're to stay alert and, uh, and, and keep watching, being in prayer. Why? It keeps us ready at all times. If you got something out of that, will you give the Lord a praise? Did you guys enjoy?